It's been six decades and several generations since the dawn of the Open era. We've had many champions ruling their generations. So which player should be the greatest of all? From career accomplishments and head-to-head -head records to playing styles, conditions and other considerations, this is the harsh truth about the GOAT debate in tennis. If you look at some of my recent videos, you would notice that 50% of them are about Novak Djokovic, for good reason. In those videos, I've given my opinions on why I think Novak is the greatest player of all time because the more he smashes these records, the more we are compelled to ask ourselves the question all over again. But the weird truth is that after thousands of hours watching games, collecting data and gaining insights as a tennis fan over the years, I'm still not so comfortable with the GOAT debate. Although it's a glamorous topic, it has become tiresome due to absurd, subjective conclusions from fans devoted to their idols. I've put a spin on the idea of the greatest player in certain aspects of the game, talked about Federer being an artist, Nadal being a warrior, Djokovic being a winner, and also talked about the legends of the 80s and 90s doing what they know how to do best. However, I feel like the GOAT debate in tennis has become a bit redundant. Besides, many people are willing to stick to flawed opinions in favour of their favourite player. But I think it's high time we discuss this. At the moment, there are three different camps on the GOAT debate. Those who think it's one member of the big three, let's say about 70% of people feel it's either Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal or Novak Djokovic. The second group are those who still think it's Pete Sampras and for the sake of simplicity, let's give them 20%. The last group are those who think it's someone else altogether. They usually go for Andre Agassi, Bjorn Borg or Jimmy Connors or even Rod Laver. Not many folks are in this category, maybe around 10% of fans, but they'll swear on their lives that it's not the big three or Sampras. You see, the thing is that many people believe that Roger Federer is and would forever be the GOAT after all. It was his assault on the record books in the 2000s that sparked the debate. But let's be realistic, we have to use objective metrics, right? No opinions, no bias, just the facts. So why don't we take a look at the numbers? The big titles, Grand Slam titles, Masters 1000s, non-calendar Grand Slams, year-end championships, ATP years as number one, ATP weeks as number one, highest ATP ranking, head-to-head -head advantage against rivals, highest winning percentage, most top three, top five and top ten wins, golden career Masters twice, triple career slam all have one name attached to them, Novak Djokovic. The sheer volume of Novak's accomplishments have become so overwhelming. Folks, we are talking about the biggest stats in tennis, and one man literally has them all, and that should objectively make him the best player in history by distance. But where does that lead us? People say that numbers aren't everything, and that greatness is equally about impact and what you bring to the sport. So I guess we have more unpacking to do then. It is quite easy to dismiss the past and forget about other legends who played tennis under different conditions. Equipment was different, surfaces were faster and a lot more different, knowledge of fitness was limited, tournament formats were not the same, training technology wasn't as advanced, and data collection wasn't as robust as it is today. Thanks to the evolution of the sport, players are now bigger, faster, stronger, quicker and better and some fans think that prime Bjorn Borg would stand no chance against Rafael Nadal or that other past players would be brushed aside by today's players. Or, maybe you are a traditionalist, you've watched tennis for decades, and you believe that if conditions and styles from all eras were neutralised, we could identify the GOAT. Even pundits and historians have flawed opinions, staying loyal to their favourite players. But the truth is that there were certainly more styles and ways to win, which made winning a Grand Slam title on multiple surfaces much more difficult. For instance, the difference between the speed on clay and grass was wider than it is today. Looking at the evolution of court surfaces over the years, hard courts have become more popular at the expense of grass and clay, probably for economical reasons. Let's imagine that Federer played in the 70s where most tournaments were played on clay. Would his game have had the same grace and finesse? And would he have been the most dominant player in an era that had many clay court specialists? Would Rafa's forehand have been the same with different racket string materials? What if many legends of the 70s and 80s all played the Australian Open, had their physios, nutritionists, psychologists? Would it have increased their longevity, slam count and performance? So doesn't this automatically suggest that we really should shouldn't favour this current era when it comes to the GOAT debate? Here is what Sampra said, which I also believe to be true. My game would certainly hold up, I believe, in any generation. With the serve and volley game, everyone talks about that game being extinct, but I still think it's an effective way to play. The game has changed, technology has changed, but in my prime, I felt unbeatable, as does Roger, as did Lendl, as did Laver. That's the way we look at our decades. To say that one is better than the other, it's hard to compare, but I felt I came out of a generation that was very, very strong, and I feel proud about that.
For those who didn't watch Pete Sampras, Bjorn Borg, McEnroe and other legends in their prime, it's hard to get the full picture of their talent profile. Sometimes the replays and highlights are not enough. For someone like Sampras, he had an incredible serve. In fact, he became the first player to serve more than 1,000 aces in a season. Sampras also had killer instincts at the net and a fantastic all-court game that could rival most players of today. He won seven Wimbledon titles in eight years, won 12 Grand Slam finals in 13 attempts during his peak years and literally dominated his generation, spending 286 weeks at the top. That's even way more than Rafael Nadal's time at the top. So why is Sampras often overlooked in the GOAT debate? Oh, did someone just say that his impact on the sport wasn't really felt? Let's get to the elephant in the room. Okay, so the impact the players bring to the sport, the values and principles are important, right? Sports generally is a form of entertainment. So if your style promotes the sports in terms of social and cultural impact, broadcasting viewership and inspiration to the next generation, you are goated. This is the reason why many people still consider Federer the goat. Many fans agree that he is the greatest ambassador of the sport and has made tennis bigger than what it is. With his variety of shots, flair and elegance, he always puts on a great show for fans while winning. This is true but would you now rate entertainment value ahead of someone who is winning way more? What's the essence of the game after all if it's not its competitive nature? And then there is also the talk of professionalism. Some say that the racket smashing and display of emotions adds more entertainment. People call Agassi and McEnroe charismatic while Sampras is seen as boring. Rafael Nadal never smashed a racket and he grinds out points to win. Yet you don't often hear people call him boring. The truth is that some personalities are just more likable than others and this affects their perception of the player's impact on the game. This then begs the question on what the exact criteria for rewarding the GOAT status is. A closer look at the main pillars of the argument reveal the flawed nature of the GOAT debate, and I discovered three main problems with it. Comparing different eras. For those trying to hypothesize different data contexts, remember that those mythical comparisons between the past greats and current players will never happen. So it is pointless talking about it in the first place because we don't have a time machine. Playing conditions and basically everything was different. How can we compare players when there are so many variables at play? I mean, even the metrics have changed constantly for decades, making evaluation even more complicated to the point of absurdity. Recency bias. Secondly, there is the problem of recency bias. The fact that you never saw Labour, Borg, McEnroe, Lendl or Sampras in their prime automatically creates a bias if all you know is the big three. Tennis, like other sports is rapidly evolving and there has to be someone who does something new successfully that no one thought of before. This sets an example for others to follow. For instance, we all thought Agassi was perfecting the art of returning serves until we encountered Prime Novak. The Serbian has 23 majors and counting, but if in 10 years time someone now has 40 majors, do we automatically remove Novak from the GOAT discussion considering he had to battle through Fedal and two generations to win his slams? The next flaw that comes to mind is significance of achievements. Some fans say that it is not a matter of what you won but how you won it. So what's better, winning when you're old or when you're young? Would you rate super dominant years over comeback from injury? Is physical talent actually superior to mental strength? This makes a huge chunk of the GOAT debate subjective objective rather than objective. You see, the problem is that there is too much room for interpreting the criteria that determines the GOAT. As a result, people easily reject the truth when it doesn't favor them. We've seen these debates all over the internet, but it's time we cut the BS. I really hate to do this, but just maybe there is no overall GOAT in tennis. It's a long conversation that never fails to divide opinion and has become an unhealthy obsession for a number of fans. On the one hand, they say stats do not show the entire picture, but on the other hand, we find analysts and fans blinded by emotions and doing whatever it takes to support their GOAT. Since there is no definite criteria, it is hard to have a definite winner. Doesn't that sound boring? I consider the GOAT discussion an intriguing but distracting epidemic. Although it helps us with fostering conversations and engaging with tennis history, it ultimately falls short of giving a clear answer. Ultimate Tennis Stats made an open era GOAT list based on a number of variables, and for me, here's the list of the <clears throat> all-time greats. Novak Djokovic, Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal, Pete Sampras, Bjorn Borg, Andre Agassi, Jimmy Connors, John McEnroe, Ivan Lendl, Boris Becker, Mats Valanda, Stefan Edberg, Rod Laver, Jim Courier, Arthur Ashe, Ken Rosewall, Andy Murray, Guillermo Vias, Leighton Hewitt, John Newcomb. So all I have to show you guys at the end of the day is a long list, which you probably already know about. Okay, that kind of sucks, but that's the whole point. It was never about who was right. The GOAT debate is really about bringing the tennis community together to discuss each own opinion on one of the biggest topics in the world. So maybe the GOAT debate should stay around. Though there will never be one true answer, I guess that's the point. Well, for me, Novak is the GOAT. Try convincing me otherwise.